Okay, well, hi everyone. Welcome to this third in our series of webinars on digital twins. So today we're gonna to look at digital twins for safety barriers. And if you do have any questions while we go through it, please just pop them in the chat and we'll get to them afterwards. We're gonna try and take about 15 minutes for the presentation and demo today, and then 10 minutes for questions, uh, 15 minutes. I think we may run over the 15 minutes a little bit because this is a, a detailed subject and we've got quite a bit to cover. So let's get going. What are we gonna talk about? We're gonna say, what's the point? Uh, in monitoring safety barriers in a digital twin. We're gonna talk about the fact that safety barrier health is a multi-dimensional problem, how a digital twin helps you solve it, and we're gonna focus a lot on the data model, and then we're gonna have a demo at the end and a chance for questions. So the key point, what's the point of what we're gonna talk about? What's different? Well, the, the digital twin lets you view the problem from multiple angles. If anyone plays golf, here there's a, a saying when you're putting you should always look at the putt from both angles because the green can look different from another viewpoint and that's exactly what we see with the problem of monitoring safety barrier health so safety barrier health can be affected by lots of different system signals and source systems it can be affected by slow moving signals like plan maintenance <clears throat> or um, personnel competency, but it can also be affected by fast moving signals like device alerts, things that can change quickly. And so the, the status information comes from the aggregation of all these sources into uh, against business rules to give you a picture of what's the real health of your safety barriers. I want to just say a little bit on what are we using as the definition of digital twin. We're defining the digital twin as a combination of three things. It's the source data that gives us the information about the current status. It's a data model that describes how all that information is related together. And it's an application that gives us the barrier management view on this data. So how is this different from a traditional application? Well, I think the main difference is that the application is a lens on a common set of data. So the data model could just be built for the safety barrier case, but it could be much wider. It could cover also the equipment, uh, equipment state, uh, condition monitoring, all sorts of other functions. And the source data is obviously in completely separate systems that we don't necessarily have control over. For example, Vantage is a third party system. So it's not a case that we can copy all that data in and make a copy of it. It sits on a third party network. So the application is, is a layer on top of this common data environment. What is the data model then? So this describes how everything is related. It's, you build it as a one-off exercise and then you maintain it. And you build it from available information, but you can add to it over time. So one of the beauties of a data model like this is that you don't have to get it 100% right first time. You build it with what you know, and as more becomes available, you expand it. The power of the data model then is that we can calculate cumulative risk. We can define rules that let us aggregate the status in different directions. So what this diagram shows is that we've got two different sources of um, data or rather sources of data for two different types of barrier element. We've got technical barriers, which are things like safety valves and trips. And we have organizational barriers, which is about people, things in your organization that are there to pre protect or prevent bad things happening. The status of these different bits comes from different places. And then we can aggregate the scores of these in different directions. So for example, we can aggregate towards a performance standard, or we can aggregate through barrier functions up to major accident hazards, or just to the, the physical areas on the platform. What we're gonna see in the demo later is that, that this ability to take the different views helps us drill down to where the problem is. And don't forget, if you have any questions on this as we go, please just stick them in the chat. So what, what does this help us do? It helps us identify weak signals. So this is like the needle in the haystack. When you've got information coming from all these places, how do we make sense of it and understand what's really important? And then it lets us prioritize work because we can see the impact of either corrective or planned maintenance on 
the ultimate protective functions and our risk posture. Just briefly about creating the digital twin, we build them from exports from systems like Aviva or SAP or Maximo. We take engineering numbering specs, we take documents with barrier um, strategies in them, and then we link them to source systems such as uh, the control system for device alerts. That might be a Honeywell or an ABB, maintenance in Maximo or SAP, and um, third party systems like I mentioned Vantage earlier or Synergy, uh, like that. Okay, so now what we're going to see in the demo, we're going to show you our application, which is called Aegis. This has been implemented for assets on a Norwegian continental shelf. The demo that we'll show has been built in collaboration with Vore Energy based on the Goliath instance we did. This allows you to, to do the monitoring of the operational risk assessments and safety barrier health required by the Norwegian Petroleum Institute, Petroleum Safety Authority, and the UK Oil and Gas Authority. It's a web-based tool and it provides an easy way to understand the information and see it in context. It allows you to see the information by different views. So this is going back to looking at the putt from different angles. You will see it by area. We can cut it then by system, by by asset, by performance standard, or by major accident hazard. So in the demo, we'll show how this allows us to, to go from what looks like a bad situation to find that actually this is just related to a couple of uh, three overdue work orders. When you have a status, the application allows you to understand why that status is what it is by clicking on it and bringing up a thing called a common menu. This is a standard component in our application that, that gives you a view on this data model. So it reveals everything that's in the data model about this. And this is where an appli the application layer <clears throat> adds in additional information. So here we have the barrier view that gets layered onto the, the standard stuff from the data model. The other thing the application lets you do is take credit for compensating measures. So when you get something that creates an impairment in a barrier, you can then go in and do a risk assessment against that and decide if it is in fact a real risk or if you did some compensating measures, could you reduce the risk or in fact, is there no risk at all? <clears throat> so what you're about to see then in the demo is a little story where we're going to see that when we go into the application, it looks like things are really bad. So our, our first view of the data implies that there's a problem. But as we then look at it from different angles, we see that, oh, actually, it looks like the, the source of this is coming from just one place. And in this case, it's the firefighting system. And then as we go in and look at other views, in, like the performance standard, we see that, sure enough, it's just a firefighting system it, that is actually has an uh, a red impairment, a bad impairment. And then as we go and drill into the work orders, we see that this is down to three overdue work orders. So if we risk assess those, or if we completed them, actually the system would turn green. Okay, so let's switch to a web browser and I'll show you the demo. <clears throat> so here's the landing page for the application. And you can see here that we've got the, the different areas, and these are the barrier areas on the platform. The main picture shows you the physical layout, and then this radar plot at the bottom left shows how red each of those areas are. So this in itself is like a different dimensional view on the problem. The fact that it's red is one piece of information, but you can see here that actually the process area is a bit more red than say the living quarters area. It has a score of 85, whereas living quarters has a score of 72. Everything here is interactive, so we can now click on it and go in and bring up detail of that area. So now we're going to the next level of information. And if we click on this view, the sunburst view, this gives us a visual picture of all the barrier <coughs> related, all the stuff in the barrier model viewed with the process area at as this like starting point, the focus, and then radiating out to the individual elements that provide that function, that protection. So here we can see that all the red seems to be coming from one area. It's like one, a slice of the pie or something has gone red. And if we track it out, we can see that there's only actually one barrier function that's red. And it's the same, it's shown visually 
at the top in this picture. This picture is like the layers of protection. The, the, if you're familiar with barrier management, you'll see, <clears throat> you'll, you'll know about the thing called the Swiss cheese model. So this is how you line up all your layers of protection and what you don't want is the holes in those layers to line up because then you can get something bad happening. So this shows us we have a hole uh, in this area, prevent escalation of fire to other equipment. If we were to go then into the performance standard view, this is the same source data, the same data model, but now we're aggregating the score towards performance standard rather than area. We see here a much different picture. Now it's mostly green and we have one amber and one red. And so now the red status is on the firefighting systems performance standard. So if we're to go into this, we can see that um, there's a lot of red or uh, there's some red SIFs, which are safety instrumented functions. And then there's a number of pieces of equipment that have an amber status. So if I bring up those, we can see that there's some planned maintenance that's overdue. It's only just gone overdue, so not too serious yet, but it has not been risk assessed. And the reason we can see that it hasn't been risk assessed is here. At the summary at the top, we've got under the none column, it hasn't, we haven't got any risk assessments. Where something has been risk assessed, we would have, it would show up in one of these columns with a tick in place. So, it, so one, what we might find as a result of this is actually, if we just get, went in and did a risk assessment on this, we may be able to turn our panel green again. If we go then into the work planning tab, we can see a list of all our different work orders. And if we sort these, in order, we start to see actually there's some common numbers coming here. This one that ends in 325, 324 and 323, they make up a lot of this table. A lot of these tags seem to be coming from those few work orders. And actually, if we make a summary of just the work orders, we can see that there's three of them. There's three preventative maintenance work orders that are affecting 18 tags in total. And there's also some corrective maintenance tags. So now we can see that really the reason that this whole platform appears to be red is because there's some overdue maintenance on the firefighting system. And we know that the firefighting system affects multiple areas because it provides the fire water and the sprinkler system. So that's how we've gone from an over, one overview, one single view, to then by looking at it from different angles, we start to much better understand the context and we can go in and uh, see what the cause is. Going back to the, this view here and pulling up the common menu, one of the beauties of this application is it will take you to the source system. So if I were to click this, the link to SAP, it will attempt to go and open that work order, which I don't have uh, access to for this demo system. But it's then enables you to take the next step and go to the source system and do any further work that you need to uh, on it. So, okay, I think we have absolutely nailed the timing. That's now 15 minutes <laughs> up. So, has anyone got any questions uh, on what we've talked about there? And I'd be happy to answer them. For example, some, um, I know a, a subject that's often a lot of interest is how does one build the data model? Uh, where do you get the information from? Where do you start even? So, Whilst um, people are thinking of questions, what I can mention is that the, uh, the, the I mentioned earlier that the beauty of using a graph database is that you can go step by step. You don't have to sort out your schema, your data architecture from day one. You start with things like the equipment hierarchy that you'll export from an SAP. I've just said the word hierarchy. The data model is not a hierarchy. Some of the source data might be, but but we, in a graph, there is no hierarchy, but you can view it as an apparent hierarchy. We can then take things like the equipment numbering specification, which gives us clues as to how to break down tags. And then you can use scripts with regular expressions to start to interpret the, the structure from other systems. And then usually there's something like a barrier manual that will have the, that will describe the structure of how your protective functions are in place. Um, that actually 
that raises a, a point I should I can chat a little bit more about as well in in building the data model the data model covers three different types of objects you've got the physical objects which you can actually walk up and touch on the platform you've got functional objects which are things that <clears throat> are there to perform a task and you've got abstract objects and abstract objects are the the where we've we think something or sorry as humans we know there is a concept that exists but it doesn't exist in in physical form and an example of that is a system a system is actually an abstract object because it's a collection of things that that we use to conveniently uh, group data you can't go up and touch a system you can touch a piece of equipment in a system but the system itself just exists as a concept but but because it exists as a concept, it can be modeled in a data model. You can make an object and call it a system and relate things to it. And this is where I think it's really powerful because you, you then have this, these uh, abstract objects that can have a status against them now. Now you've got a home to store things like what's the status of this system? Or what was the, the history of status over time? And in fact, a barrier is actually an abstract concept because it's, made up of lots of different protective functions the actual concept of the barrier you can't go up and, and touch say a barrier function it's uh, pieces of equipment exist because of that barrier function but the barrier function itself is an abstract concept um, and that's one of the beauties again of a graph model these can be added in and they can also be added in later uh, as you think of more of them so yeah, any other questions? Amit has asked, how is the source data validated? That's a great question. Thanks, Ahmed. So th th that's the classic problem, rubbish in, rubbish out. So if the, if the source data is junk, you'll get nonsense in. There's a couple of ways that we do that. One is different contexts in the barrier panel. So you can, you can view the information in a, what you might call a quality assured context whereby you only show data that has been risk assessed. Uh, and sometimes that's called the management view because uh, th this shows the sort of the agreed view of the risk status. And that's that way you would catch something that comes in that's really spurious. The alternative context is then the real time view where you would see information as it comes in raw and actually the demo here is the real-time view because because you've seen things that aren't yet risk assessed as soon as they come in they're just shown and that's when you have discipline responsible engineers responsible for um for say uh, functional safety would be monitoring the panel and checking that the information that comes in is true uh, and valid there's then another level you'll have some filtering on the information that you uh, you use or you select to calculate your status on so we have business rules that determine what information we extract from the source systems and then we have processing rules that determine how it's handled so hopefully with the combination of those things the instance of spurious stuff should be low it is true that sometimes some rubbish does get through and uh, at the moment i don't know of any magic way to to catch stuff <laughs> the, the usually the stuff that gets through is stuff that no one's ever seen before and it's an edge case and then you code for it and then it doesn't get through again so i think uh as best as best we can it gets better over time you, you do the best you can and then you continue to improve the system over time does that help so ahmed's also put, put so does data validation form part of the engineering execution or implementation? Yes, it absolutely does. And a big part of this is testing then. So, so validating, it, it takes almost as much effort to, to do the testing and validation as it does to, to configure the system, possibly even more actually, but for exactly the reason you state that you need to make sure that what you're presenting is valid. And so data validation is a very important part. And we do a lot of testing. We're just going through that actually on another project. The first thing we did was we've defined a load of test scenarios and now we're writing a test plan to try and come up with all the ways 
to first of all test that it functions correctly and then the edge cases to say well what might happen that would throw an, an erroneous result in there thank you good question doesn't appear to be any others i don't know if everyone knows but you can ask the question through the q a feature so it should be at the bottom of your screen if you click on that you should be able to type in some questions that's right i'd be um i've got a, a poll actually that whilst we're waiting i'll just launch a quick poll i'd be interested to know how many people are involved in the management of safety barriers so um i've just started a poll let me know because i think it's quite a common subject it's well understood within the industry but actually the the management of it is quite difficult and there's various documents like the norwegian psa has issued their memorandum on safety barrier health management uh, and it has a number of requirements in there and suggestions of how you do it uh, because it's such a because it's a multi-dimensional problem it's um it's tricky to monitor and a lot of the the attempts so far usually result revolve around excel and powerpoint reports periodically maybe once a month uh, i think the beauty of this new digital approach is it's real time it updates in real time uh, and gives you a, a, a dynamic or a view of the dynamic position of risk and it's also audited one of the very interesting things we find when doing an implementation is that it it reveals say inconsistencies or, or it forces discussion around what what should make something red because previously if it's just a a report like a, a flat report in a pdf or a powerpoint the reasoning behind it being red may be a bit opaque and it may be to some extent down to someone's judgment but when you digitize the rules and they're processed you actually have to agree them because you have to turn them into code and it's extremely powerful just that process to draw out an agreement on what the actual rules are and it's like the first step in digitizing a process is to be able to write it down and agree on it because until you can do that then it won't automate itself by magic <laughs> Ahmed's also asked another question. Um, do you have any references or engagements with middle-based oh, with middle-based NOCs? Uh, I guess Middle East-based yeah. NOCs. Yeah. Um, we we had some engagement, but uh, through a partner. But actually, at the moment, no, it's all gone quiet. We have no engagement in the Middle East. So delighted if you, there's some conversations you'd like to have uh, about engaging with folks in the Middle East to um, I'll miss I can message you afterwards about that if you're interested so I don't know if everyone can see the poll screen but it's just popped it's popped up on my screen so it might be floating on your screen so there's a question on there just to click yes or no to everybody yeah please do let me know and we've got a feedback form actually which would be great if folks could just take a minute to fill it in it's so useful just to hear how these webinars are and particularly things around the timing if the content's useful because this is the third we've done now we've been really encouraged by the feedback so far and we definitely plan to do more of them the link to feedback form is now in the chat brilliant so hopefully you can all see that in the chat we'll send it around afterwards in an email as well but please do um, please do fill that in really appreciate that so i think if um, there's no other questions for now then um, we can end a couple of minutes early uh, and thanks very much for everyone for attending and look forward to seeing you on the next one.